This is Lampedusa, a picturesque island in the Mediterranean Sea, typically known for its tranquil beauty and a modest population of just over 6,000 people. But last September, the island's calm was disrupted in a way it had rarely seen before. During a single week, a staggering 10,000 individuals made the perilous journey from Africa aboard makeshift metal boats, seeking refuge and a better life in the European Union. And this is not just happening on Lampedusa. Some 250,000 irregular immigrants have already arrived in Europe between January and October of this year, of whom 130,000 have arrived in Italy, an 83% increase compared to last year. Without a doubt, Italy and the entirety of the EU are on the brink of another immigration crisis, reminiscent of 2015 and 2016. But the European Union is close to finally passing the three-year-in-the-making new pact on asylum and migration, which they hold as an historic agreement to reshape how the continent processes and relocates asylum seekers. Will this solve the issue though? This video will dissect the pact and determine whether we at the EU Made Simple think it will make a difference. The new pact consists of five main pillars, aiming to balance the responsibility of frontline nations like Italy, Greece and Spain, which handled the initial processing of most asylum seekers, with the support and solidarity of other EU nations. Sure, like most EU regulation, the pact looks a bit dry and dull, but stick with this video. We're diving in the most exciting and debated parts that have stirred up quite the storm among the EU member states. And please subscribe to the channel if you like simple to understand EU content. Let's start with the least controversial pillars of the pact, the screening and Eurodac regulations. The screening regulation introduces a pre-entry procedure aimed at quickly examining the profiles of asylum seekers. This applies to non-EU nationals who enter the bloc irregularly, are rescued at sea, or are caught after avoiding border controls. During this procedure, which should not exceed five days, information such as the migrant's identity, fingerprints, facial image, health, security, and vulnerability will be collected. Once this data is assembled, national authorities will determine the subsequent steps in the asylum process. Biometric data is stored in Eurodac, an EU database used by 27 EU and some non-EU countries since 2003. The updated Eurodac regulation now focuses on monitoring individual applicants instead of just their applications. This aims to quickly identify repeat applicants, deter migration between countries, and speed up the returns for denied requests. Right after the screening process, the migrant will formally apply for international protection, which brings us to the next pillar of the pact, the asylum procedure. This new regulation introduces a streamlined two-track asylum system, where the aforementioned screening process designates the appropriate track for each applicant. Firstly, the so-called border procedure, which applies to applicants from countries with low recognition rates, such as Tunisia, Egypt, and Morocco, where there's no immediate danger. Individuals who have given false information or who are deemed a risk to national security will also follow this procedure. These individuals won't be permitted entry into the national territory, may be subjected to detention measures, and won't have the right to see a judge. The border procedure should take up to 12 weeks, and if the request is denied, authorities have an additional 12 weeks to deport the individual. Secondly, there's the normal asylum procedure. This includes individuals from countries experiencing civil war, such as parts of Syria, as well as families with children under 12 years of age. These individuals should be granted entry into the national territory, provided with accommodation and given the right to have their case heard by a judge. Furthermore, the regulation mandates that all 27 member states must have the capacity to process at least 30,000 asylum applications and return decisions annually. Next, we come to the most groundbreaking pillar of the pact, the Migration Management Regulation. Under this new mandatory solidarity plan, the EU aims to relocate 30,000 asylum seekers across Europe annually. This will compel other countries to help out through three different options. Take in some asylum seekers, pay a contribution of 20,000 euros for each asylum seeker rejected, or finance infrastructure or manpower needs. This means that an individual in the normal asylum procedure will be able to be relocated to another EU country. For example, from the coast of Italy to the Netherlands. This has led to significant tensions among the member states. Historically hardline negotiators on this topic, Poland and Hungary, were the primary opponents of the Solidarity Clause, as they don't want to be forced to accept migrants. Poland and Hungary 
was not satisfied with the proposal, but they pushed us through, I mean, pushed through the proposal. Because legally we are, uh, how to say it, we are raped. So if you are raped, legally, forced to accept something what you don't like, how would you like to have a compromise and agreement? It's impossible. Beyond Hungary and Poland, Austria, Czechia and Slovakia abstain from the vote altogether, indicating that they aren't fully supportive either. Germany, too, has posed its own set of challenges, but for different reasons. They have often been at odds with Italy, especially over the rights of migrants. A recent contentious issue has been NGO ships funded by Germany in the Mediterranean Sea, which Italy argues act as a pull factor for migrants. But let's go back to the pact. Another part of the migration management regulation is deals with third countries and migrant returns. The EU signed a deal with Tunisia in July 2023 to reduce irregular migration to the EU. Here the EU pledges 105 million euros to Tunisia for counter-smuggling actions, better border management and youth economic opportunities, along with providing technical training. In return, Tunisia will commit to boosting border guards and patrols, enhancing intelligence sharing with the EU, and taking firm actions against smugglers. And crucially, Tunisia has agreed to accept the return of not only its own citizens, but also other migrants who transited through Tunisia and are in the EU illegally. The official text mandates that a migrant should have stayed, settled, or have family in a country to be sent there. However, disagreements in the EU arose over the destination of rejected asylum seekers. Italy once again sought more flexibility, but Germany stressed human rights. Most countries agreed with Italy, and while the EU maintains its commitment to human rights, it's up to the individual countries to determine if a destination meets these standards. The last piece of the pact worth mentioning is the crisis response regulation. This would allow member states to take temporary measures should a sudden and massive influx of third country nationals enter the country. For example, a more accelerated examination of asylum applications at the border detaining asylum seekers for up to 20 weeks while their applications are being processed, and detaining rejected asylum applicants for up to 20 weeks while their return to their country of origin is being organized. NGOs warn that these changes might result in widespread detainment and weaken asylum procedures, risking sending migrants back to harmful situations. Germany shared these worries, especially about children's and families' rights, and had previously stalled the law by abstaining. However, a final text has now been agreed upon. So, these are the primary points of the new pact. There's certainly more to explore, but our immediate concern is evaluating its potential impact. And to be honest, at EU Made Simple, we think the EU's deals with non-EU countries simply aren't good enough. While some of the proposed changes sound promising, their effectiveness hinges on the ability to return rejected applicants. Without this, even a two-track asylum system will not bring about the desired improvements. For perspective, in 2022, EU countries issued 422,000 return decisions, yet fewer than a quarter of those non-EU nationals actually left the EU. A primary challenge in achieving higher return rates is the refusal of origin countries to readmit asylum seekers. Often, migrants arrive in Europe without any form of identification, possibly having discarded them intentionally. This absence of ID complicates the process of verifying their identity, making migrant returns much harder. The EU strategy of forming deals with third-party countries to manage this issue has seen some success in the past. A prime example is the EU-Turkey deal in 2016, which significantly reduced the influx of migrants. These agreements not only address the return of declined asylum seekers, but also incorporate measures to prevent irregular migration to Europe in the first place. However, the EU-Turkey migrant deal is set to expire in 2024, with its renewal uncertain. The EU has said that it is willing to continue working with Turkey on migration, but it has also said that the deal must be reformed to ensure that the rights of refugees and migrants are protected. We believe such agreements are crucial. Renewing the Turkey deal is essential, and forging similar arrangements with northern African countries, such as Morocco, as well as other origin and transit nations, is imperative. Overall, we believe that migration and asylum issues can only be addressed by an EU-wide approach. The proposed pact signifies a positive step, yet we can't help but question why, seven years since the last migration crisis, has it taken this long to finalize? So what next? 
Well, it's likely to take another six months before the deal is ratified, as negotiations with the European Parliament are still outstanding. Then once ratified, it will probably take a staggering two more years before it's fully implemented across member states. Such prolonged timelines are concerning, and might not only worsen the migration challenges, but also inadvertently amplify support for far-right parties. But what do you think of the new asylum and migration pact? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoy these short and informative videos about the EU, then please subscribe and like the video. And if you want to support the channel further, please sign up to Patreon. Until next time.